Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about mathematical induction. The great thing about math is that we can trust it. Regardless of the technology that math enables us to have in our daily lives, hello internet, what we learn in math is entirely beautifully true. We can have certainty in this truth because of proof. In math, we start with a few simple ideas and then we use proof to build a tower of logic. Because we prove every theorem and method we work with, we can trust the whole of mathematics. Mathematics is built on this concept of truth, that we start with some things that we really truly, that we just can take for granted, absolutely certain, these axiomatic truths that we looked at in geometry, for example, previously, you've seen in some courses. We start off with these basic axioms and then we work up from there using logic. We can use proof to make sure we can trust every single thing we work with. So far in this course, we've proved many things with a variety of logical arguments. We've made very strong logical arguments that show, without a doubt, that something has to be true. In this lesson, we're going to see a new form for proofs, mathematical induction. This method can be used anywhere from our current level of math all the way to very advanced mathematics. So it's this really flexible kind of proof that lets us show a lot of things. It's a very powerful way of proving things. All right. So let's talk about belief versus proof. In math, it's important to recognize that there's a difference between believing something is true and proving something is true. So while we may strongly believe in something, that implies that there's still some level of reasonable doubt. Believing in something doesn't mean that we can know it absolutely certain. It just means that it's probably true, but there's still this tiny crack that maybe it's not going to wind up being true. We can only be certain about something once we have proved it. We can only be certain that something is true once once we have proof. So a proof is an irrefutable logical argument. It is something that very clearly shows, and there's no way to disagree with it, that given this, given some something, we can show that it's always going to wind up working out. So it gives us total certainty. This means that when we notice a pattern in the way things work, we don't know for sure that it will always hold. We may believe that it will hold, but until we prove it, we cannot be absolutely certain. So we may believe in something, but we have to go and prove it before we, cannot, before we can be absolutely certain. So proof is this really integral part to how mathematics works. So, as an example, consider the following. In the 1600s, a mathematician named Fermat noticed a pattern. It seemed to him that all numbers of the form below were prime numbers. They are prime numbers. So, Pn, the Fermat number, the nth Fermat number, 2 to the 2 to the n, plus 1, where n is a natural number. So, 0, 1, 2, working our way up. So, if we've got P0, then that would be equal to 2 to the 2 to the 0 plus 1. What's 2 to the 2 to the 0? Well, 2 to the 2 to the 0, 2 to the 0, any number raised to the 0 is the 1, so it's 2 to the 1. So we've got 2 to the 2 to the 0 plus 1 plus 1, 2 to the 1 plus 1, that gets us 3. And indeed, 3 is a prime number. Next up, the next Fermat number would be 2 to the 2 to the 1. 2 to the 2 to the 1 plus 1 gets us 5, and indeed, that's a prime number. The next one would be 2 to the 2 to the 2 plus 1, that's going to come out to be 17. Indeed, that's a prime number. Now we're starting to get to a place where we can't immediately see that they are prime, but 2 to the 2 to the 3 plus 1 is 257, and you can check that that does wind up being prime. Next one would be 60, uh, sorry, next would be 2 to the 2 to the 4th plus 1, which comes out to be 65,537, and indeed, if you work at it, you can eventually check by hand that this does come out to be a prime number as well. So Fermat could verify that this was true for all for the values of 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Raising 2 to the 2 to the 0 to the 1 to the 2 to the 3 to the 4 plus 1, each one of these came out to be a prime number. So he could check by hand that you're able to make primes for these first five Fermat numbers. Fermat number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, able to show for sure that they do make primes. However, the next Fermat number was too large for him to check, and he couldn't figure a way to prove it prime. So the next one is 2 to the 2 to the 5th plus 1, which is equal to a whopping 4,294,967,297. Big number, right? That's going to be really hard to check by hand, and Fermat wasn't able to check by hand. So he couldn't figure out a clever way to prove for sure that it was prime without having to check by hand, and it was too big for him to check by hand, so he couldn't show that it was prime. Nonetheless, he had noticed a pattern, so he made a conjecture, that is, a hypothesis, an expectation of how things will work, that all numbers of the form 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 are prime. But noticing a pattern does not necessarily prove it to be true. So this was a conjecture, but we didn't know for sure whether it was going to wind up being a true conjecture or a false conjecture, if it was going to wind up being disproven. 
It was not until the 1700s that we knew whether or not the conjecture was true. Another mathematician named Euler showed that the fifth, sorry, the sixth Fermat number, P5, could be factored. So 2 to the 2 to the fifth plus 1, which comes out to be 4,294,967,297, it can be broken down into the two numbers 641 times 6,700,417. So since that number, since that Fermat number can be broken down into two factors, that means it is not a prime number. Thus, Euler had shown that not all Fermat numbers are prime because there's at least one of them that can be broken into factors. Thus, he had proven the conjecture false. He had shown that there was a counterexample, so that conjecture that Fermat had originally thought that 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 was always prime, that is not true. We've proven it to not be true. It's relatively easy to prove that something is not true. You only need a single counterexample. One counterexample that cancels out and says, nope, here's a way that you can't have that work, that proves that that does not work. But how can we prove that a pattern will hold forever, that we've got some sequence of things that's going to always wind up being the case? So we can do this with mathematical induction. There's other ways to do this. You can make logical arguments in other ways, but a good way to do this is with mathematical induction. It often works well. Before formally stating the principle of mathematical induction, let's look at a metaphor to help us understand how induction works. So here's our metaphor. Let's imagine we have an infinitely long line of dominoes and they're stood up on their ends, like in this picture here, right? So domino, 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 domino. Like if we were setting up a bunch of dominoes to push it over and having them thup, 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 right? Falling over dominoes. So that's sort of the image we want to have in our mind. Okay, so we could name the dominoes based on their location and line. The very first domino that would be start on the line on the very far left side, we could call D1. So here would be our D1, our first domino. The next domino we could call D2, so our second domino, D2. And so on, so here'd be D3 and D4, and it's going to just continue on in that pattern. So any domino, there exists some N that we can name any domino with, right? We talk about some domino, there is some number we can associate with it, because we can just count up from the beginning and see what number we have to count to to get to that domino. So that means we can name any given domino. All right. We have two guarantees. Consider if we had two guarantees. The first guarantee is that the first domino, D1, will definitely fall over. We are going to be absolutely certain that D1 is going to fall. So our first domino, D1, is for sure going to fall over. We know our very first domino in the line is going to fall over. It's going to get pushed somehow, a gust of wind is going to happen, an earthquake, but something will certainly happen. Who knows what it is, but we are guaranteed it will fall over for sure. So we know our very first one is going to fall over. That's our first guarantee. Our second guarantee is that given any sequential pair, so any pair of dominoes, so we could, for example, talk about some dk and dk plus 1 for any positive integer k. So some dk in the line, and then the next guy would be called dk plus 1, right? So if we're at the k spot, the k plus 1 would be the next spot. And so if dk falls, if the domino on the left falls, so if the domino on the left falls, dk, domino on the left, then the next domino in line, dk plus 1, will also fall. So this is our next guarantee. So if the domino on the left falls, so if the domino on the left falls, then the next domino will fall as well. So we're going to get falling from the next domino. So if dk falls, dk plus 1 must fall. So we've got here dk falls, and then at the next one we've got dk falls, dk falls, dk plus 1 must also fall. So if one domino falls, the next domino in line is always guaranteed to fall, right? We've got this guarantee that the dominoes do indeed always push each other over for any pair of dominoes we wind up looking at. All right, so we've got these two things for sure. So we've got two guarantees and this infinite line of dominoes, some, some line of dominoes, and the two guarantees that the first domino, D1, is definitely going to fall over. And that if some domino falls over, some DK falls over, it will cause the next domino, DK plus 1, to also fall over. Given these two guarantees, we now know that absolutely all the dominoes in our infinitely long line of dominoes will fall over over. We know for sure that all of them are going to fall over. Why? Well, because by the first guarantee, our first guarantee, we know D1 falls, right? We know the very first guy in the line, he has to fall because we we're guaranteed he was going to fall. Then by the second guarantee, 
If some domino falls, then we know the next domino falls. So by our first guarantee, we know D1 must fall. But by the second guarantee, we know D2 must fall because D1 is the guy before D2, so D2 must now fall as well. Then by our second guarantee, once again, since D2 just fell, we know that D3 must fall. Then by our second guarantee again, we know that since D3 just fell, we know D4 must fall. And then since D4 just fell, D5 must fall, D6 must fall, D7 must fall, D8, D9, D10, D10, forever and ever and ever, right? So thus the dominoes, all the dominoes must fall over. We know that every single domino must fall over because we're guaranteed that the first domino is going to fall and we know that every domino after a domino that's fallen ha will fall as well. So since D1 falls, we know D2 must fall, we know D3 must fall, and we can work our way out going forever. So this is inductive thinking, step-by-step -step logic. This is the idea of mathematical induction, that we have this first premise that the definite thing is going to happen for the first thing, and that if something happens, we know the next thing has to happen as well. So we can start at D1, and from that induction idea, we can move forward forever, stepping along. Mathematical induction is extremely similar. So this idea of using it in math is very, very much the same thing as this line of dominoes. It's just that instead of dominoes, we will work with statements, and instead of fall over, we will say is true. But other than that, the logic behind it is exactly the same. And I know that might seem kind of like a crazy thing to say, that we can connect dominoes and statements, and we can connect falling over with being true, but really the idea behind it is the same. And we'll see why in just a second, is that we've got this one thing that starts it off, and then we've got this other guarantee that says it keeps going forever and ever and ever. All right, now we're ready to look at the principle. So the principle of mathematical induction is let P1, P2, P3, P4 going on, Pn going on forever be some infinitely long sequence of statements or just some sequence of statements where n is a positive integer. So we're stepping forward one statement at a time. And we're guaranteed two things. If P1 is true and if pk is true for a positive integer k, then pk plus 1 must also be true. Then we know that the statement pn is true for all positive integers n. Why is this the case? Well, it's very much the same thing as we just saw with the dominoes. We've got p1 is definitely true. The very first guy, right? We've got p1, p2, p3, p4, p5 going on forever. We've effectively got this infinitely long line of sequences. And we are guaranteed by our very first thing that p1 has to be true. So p1, true. Then our next guarantee is that if something is true, the next thing in line must be true. So our first guarantee was P1 is true. That means P2, since it's the next thing in line, must also be true. That means by that same guarantee that the next thing in line is true, P3 must be true, P4 must be true, P5 must be true, P6 must be true, and it goes on forever and ever and ever. And that's why we now know that Pn is going to be true for all positive integers n, is because since the first thing was in line, was guaranteed by that first guarantee, and the second thing is going to wind up happening because of that second guarantee, and then the third guarantee, I'm sorry, the third one will happen because of the second guarantee again, and then the fourth thing will happen because of the second guarantee again, right? We can keep using that step, 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 step that the second guarantee gives us. We're able to step forever and ever and ever. We're able to have that infinitely many of these statements are going to wind up being true. Okay. We often call the first step first step that P1 is true, the base case, because it's establishing the basis that we're working from. It's the very first guy in the line of true statements. The second step is often called the inductive step, because it's the thing where the actual induction occurs. That induction being if 1, then 2, if 2, then 3. So 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6. The fact that we can sort of start at one place and then step forever forward. In the inductive step, the assumption if pk is true, this part right here, the if pk is true, is called the inductive hypothesis. Because it's the hypothesis that we use to show pk plus 1 will also be true. So we have to have this assumption that if this thing happens, then this other thing will happen, right? It's just like with the dominoes, we say, if some domino falls over, then this thing is going to happen in response. But now we're talking in terms of truth. If this thing is true, then the next thing down the line must be true as well. All right. Before we keep going, I want to have a quick remark on statements. The principle of mathematical induction is based on statements. We might be tempted to assume that any statement we see written out will automatically be true, but this is not necessarily the case. Just because you see something written out does not mean you want to assume it will always, always be true, right? Don't believe everything you read. A statement, like in English, is just a string of words and or symbols. So, for example, the statement, ice cream is made of hair, 
is most emphatically not true, right? Ice cream is not made of hair. That is not true. But it's still a statement, albeit a false statement. So just because something is said doesn't mean it's always going to wind up being true. Similarly, in math, the statement 3 plus 5 plus 7 equals 10 is false. That is not true. 3 plus 5 plus 7 is not equal to 10, but it's still a statement, just not a true statement, right? 3 plus 5 plus 7 is actually equal to 15, so we know that this one here is a false statement. Most of the time when we're working in math, we're always allowed to assume that the statements we're working with are true because they're given to us directly from the problem and we're not told to question them. We're saying, start with this thing and work with it. Or we're working on the problem from the beginning like a word problem and we see from the information we're given, we can use logic to go, oh, well, this must definitely be the case. This must definitely be the case. So we're able to work with these things and be certain of their truth. But just because something is said does not necessarily mean it's always going to be true. Everything we've dealt with so far in math, we've been able to assume the truth of things because we know we weren't, we weren't being given lies. But now, if we're just talking about statements in general, we have to evaluate their truth before we can trust them. So when we're working with mathematical induction, it is our job to not only set up the statements PN, but to also prove that the statements are going to be true statements. We're not just going to get the statements and assume they're true. We have to get the statements and then show yes for sure that they wind up being true. And occasionally we might discover that the statements we've got are actually wind up being false statements, at which point we'll have to go back to the drawing board and figure out a way that we can state it truthfully, or that will wind up being the answer is the fact that it's actually not true. But generally we're going to wind up showing that it's true. Now, of course, if we want to show that the n goes on infinitely, that all pn for any 1, 2, 3, 4 going on forever, that they're all true, we can't prove each one of them by hand because we can't prove an infinite number of things, right? We're not going to be able to have an infinite number of, infinite amount of time to prove an infinite number of things. So instead, we have to use some way to be able to show all of them at once. So we can either use some sort of clever logical argument or we can use proof by mathematical induction where we can show that the first step will wind up always being true and that if you have some step, the next thing's going to wind up being true to work our way out infinitely, like that line of dominoes like we were just talking about a few moments ago. All right, so how do we use mathematical induction? If we're going to use induction to prove that some statement PN is true for all N, we must prove two things. First, the base case, that P1 is true, that our very first statement is a true statement. And then we have to do the inductive step, that if some PK is true, the next guy in line, PK plus 1, must also be true. So that means when we're working with proof by induction, we have at least two separate steps. So we've got two separate things we have to deal with proving the base case and proving the inductive step. We have to show each one of these. I'm going to strongly recommend noting which one you're working on and making it so you can keep the parts separate. How you work on the base case normally isn't going to really help you deal with the inductive step. How you work on the inductive step normally isn't really going to help you do on the base case. So just write base case, prove your base case. Then write inductive step, then prove your inductive step. It'll help you keep track of what you're doing. It'll help keep it from being confusing. And it will help other people who read your work in the future understand what happened there. In general, proving the base case almost always is going to be easier by far. Normally, we just wind up simplifying the statement, whatever this P1 statement winds up being, and we verify that it is indeed a true statement. So it's just make sure, yeah, this is true. The tricky part normally winds up being dealing with the inductive step. To prove the inductive step, we must first assume the inductive hypothesis PK is true. We have to start off by assuming if PK is true, so we have to say, okay, PK is true, now let's show that PK plus 1 is also going to be true. So once we make this assumption, we somehow have to work to prove that PK plus 1 must then also be true. Now, notice we haven't actually proven PK to be true. We're just asking ourselves, if PK were true, would PK plus 1 also be true? We're saying, if we had this place that we could start from, would the next thing be true? It's like the dominoes. If this domino were to fall over, would the next guy in line fall over? That's all we need for mathematical induction. We don't have to prove that the guy in the middle will fall over. We just have to say, well, if he were to fall over, would the next guy fall over as well? Right. It helps a lot to somehow include part of the statement for PK when we're writing out PK plus 1. This is because we're almost inevitably going to wind up using the inductive hypothesis, right? We have to use this inductive hypothesis, PK is true, otherwise we wouldn't have needed to talk about if PK being true, if to show that PK plus 1 is true. So we're going to wind up using that inductive hypothesis that PK is true, so we have to have some way of talking about it in our PK plus 1 statement. So we can't use our hypothesis, we can't use our hypothesis about PK unless it somehow appears in PK plus 1. That means when we wind up writing out 
the pk plus one statement, we have to figure out some way to make pk or some portion of pk show up in some way so that we can apply that inductive hypothesis and use what we know, what we've assumed it to be true. So it's important to have that wind up showing up. We'll see how that occurs as we're actually working through problems and examples. All right, all this is gonna make a lot more sense once we see it in action. So if it seems a little bit confusing right now, just follow it through. It's gonna make a whole lot more sense as we actually work through what's going on. All right, so consider the following formula, which we proved in the lesson arithmetic sequences and series. We proved that the adding the numbers one plus two plus three plus blah, 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 up until we get to plus n, so all the numbers consecutively from one up until some n that we choose, is equal to n times n plus one divided by two. Previously, we proved this by a logical argument that involved equations and elimination, right? Adding up two equations, if you watch that lesson, we were able to prove it through a logical argument. But we also could prove it through mathematical induction. So let's see another way to prove this through mathematical induction. We can see that the above equation is effectively our statement PN. We can turn this into our statement PN, is this guy right here. So how would this work? Well, our first statement P1 would be if we went from one up until an N of one, right? P1. So 1 up until 1, well, that's just going to wind up being 1. So 1 added to itself, is that indeed equal to 1 times 1 plus 1 over 2? That's the first statement. The first statement is that 1 is equal to 1 times 1 plus 1 over 2. Our next statement at P2 would be 1 plus up until 2, so that's just going to be 1 plus 2, and that's going to be equal. The statement says that it's equal. It will be up to us to verify that this stuff actually winds up working out. 2 times 2 plus 1 over 2. And then the next one, P3, would be equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3. We get up to the third, and it's saying the statement is that that is indeed equal to 3 times 3 plus 1 over 2. And finally, the really interesting interesting one here is pn, which is add all the numbers from 1 up until n, and that that is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2. So this is our statement pn, this way of writing it out here. Didn't mean to cut through that too. So to prove by induction that the statement pn equals 1 added all the numbers up until n is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2, to prove this is true for all positive integers, if we're going to use proof by induction, we have to prove two things. We have to prove both the base case, p1, and the inductive step that pk implies pk plus 1. The truth of some pk in the middle implies that pk plus 1, the next guy down the line, also has to be true. Let's begin with the base case. The base case is normally the easier thing by far. So our P1 statement was that 1 is equal to 1 times 1 plus 1 over 2. Now, that's just a statement. Once again, it's up to us to verify the truth of the statement. So we'll write in the middle here this little equal sign with a question mark because we don't actually know for sure that it's equal, right? The statement said 1 is equal to 1 times 1 plus 1 over 2, but we don't know for sure that's true, right? The statement could be lying to us. It's up to us to figure out, is this indeed true? Is the left side? Are the left side and the right side actually equal to each other. So we work this out. We've got 1. Is it equal to? Let's check. 1 times 1 plus 1 over 2. So 1 compared to 1 times 2 over 2, right? 1 plus 1 is 2. And then that simplifies. The 2's cancel out. We've got 1 equals 1. And indeed, that is true. So that means our base case checks out. We have shown the base case is definitely true. Next up, we move on to the inductive step. So we write inductive step so that we see where we are. The very first thing we always do with the inductive step is we write out our inductive hypothesis. We say, if pk is true, so we assume pk, which would be 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up until we get to some k, is equal to k times k plus 1 over 2 is true. So we're assuming this thing is true. pk, which is the statement 1 plus 2 plus 3 up until plus k is equal to k times k plus 1 over 2, we can just take this as cold hard fact. It's the assumption that if this domino were to fall, now we just need to work on the next domino falling. We don't have to prove for certain that this guy will prove. We're allowed to assume it because it works in combination with the first guarantee. All right, so we've got this assumed as true. With the inductive hypothesis in mind, we want to show, so our inductive hypothesis right here, it is up to us to show that pk plus 1 must also be true. So we can write out pk plus 1 as 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus up until, well now we're going up to k plus 1, right? So up until plus k plus 1. And we can plug in k plus 1 times k plus 1 plus 1 all over 2. So we see that this is what the statement would be. However, we can't really see how does pk show up in here? How does something in this portion right here show up? Because remember what we talked about before, we're going to have to use our inductive hypothesis. That's what the inductive hypothesis is there for, right? If we could prove this without an inductive hypothesis, why are we doing induction? So we have to use that inductive hypothesis somehow to be able to apply it here so that we can show pk plus 1 must be true. 
So we need to get some way to see some portion of PK appear. So we realize, oh, we can rewrite what we've got here. We can rewrite PK plus 1. So we could write PK plus 1 as it is above, but we can't easily see PK in it. So instead, we write it out as PK plus 1 is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot 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 plus K plus K plus 1. How can we do this? Well, we know there had to be in K in here, right? Because it's all the numbers from 1 up until K plus 1. So K has to be included in there because it's the number before K plus 1, right? K plus 1 minus 1. K. So it has to be the number before it. So it has to be included in somewhere in our ellipsis, in our continuing pattern. So we can write it out. Now that means that we've got PK showing up right here. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 up until K. Oh, hey, look, that's this guy right here. So we can bring this to bear. And we just simplified the right side a little bit. That just winds up being the same thing, right? K plus 1 times K plus 1 plus 1 is just K plus 1 times K plus 2 over 2. Just simplified the right side. Okay, so we've got our inductive hypothesis that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot 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 plus k equals k times k plus 1 over 2. We're assuming that's true, and it is our job to show that 1 plus 2 plus 3 up until plus k plus 1 is equal to k plus 1 times k plus 2 over 2. So we want to verify the statement below. We want to show that this is not a question mark, that it is indeed the left side. The left side and the right side are equal to each other for sure. So we want to verify this. We want to make that question mark be absolutely an equal sign. So what we notice is, hey, we've got pk here, right? Our inductive hypothesis pk. So we can substitute pk, our hypothesis in. What we've got here is the same thing as what we've got here. So we can plug in, we can swap out this stuff right here. So now we've gotten our hypothesis into the game. We've been able to plug it in. So now we can start using it. We can work things out. We're almost always, almost absolutely certainly going to use that inductive hypothesis. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to be doing induction. So we bring that hypothesis to bear somehow. So we can plug it in generally. And from here, we just have to simplify the equation. It's not really equation because we don't actually know if the two sides are equal to each other. So it's not technically equation. But we can write it as this idea of, are they equal to? Let's see if they are the same thing on either side. And then we can just verify that if it does come out to be clearly the same on both sides, so if it comes out to be clearly the same on both sides, then we will know pk plus 1 is true. right? If we can get rid of that equation, if we can get rid of that, sorry, if we can get rid of that equal sign in our equation, if we can turn it to just an equals, then we will know that indeed pk plus 1 is that, that that is true. And we will have shown pk plus 1 is true from pk, and we will have completed our inductive step. OK, so we just worked this out. What we had on the left side was k times k plus 1 over 2 plus k plus 1. And then on the right side, we had k plus 1 times k plus 2 over 2. So we expand k times k plus 1. That gets us k squared plus k. We can put this over fractions so that we can have them over common denominators. So we have 2k plus 2 over 2. We expand the right side, k plus 1 times k plus 2. That's going to be k times k, k squared, plus 2k plus 1k, so 3k, plus 1 times 2, 2. So we get k squared plus 3k plus 2 all over 2. Now we just combine these two fractions here, k squared plus k over 2 plus 2k plus 2 over 2, is going to be k squared plus k plus 2k plus 2 all over 2, which simplifies to nice k squared plus 3k plus 2 over 2, which is equal to k squared plus 3k plus 2 over 2, which is indeed definitely always going to be true. So we have just shown, yes, our inductive step does work. We have proved the inductive step to be true. If we have pk true, then pk plus 1 must be true from our logic. So we have completed both steps. We've completed the base case back a while, and we just completed the inductive step. That means we've completed both of the parts necessary for a proof by induction. We have to prove both of those parts. So we now know pn is true for all n. That is, for any positive integer, we have that 1 plus 2 plus 3 up until plus n is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2. And I like to complete my proofs with a little square just to say we have completed the proof. It is done. And there we are. That is an example of how proof by induction works. Right. At this level in math, you'll often be directly told what to prove. You'll be given some formula or some statement, and it's going to say, go prove this. So you'll be given something, and it'll be your job to prove by induction, since this is a you know thing about proof by induction. But in most of the things, if you're asked to prove something else, it would also just be, here's something, go prove it, like when you were in geometry class. However, sometimes you won't be given a formula. So sometimes you will not be given a formula. Instead, it's going to be your job to discover a pattern inside of that sequence, inside of what you're looking at, and then create some sort of hypothetical formula that will describe that pattern, and finally, to prove that your formula will always work. 
So the proof itself can be challenging. That's what we're working on. But sometimes the hardest part isn't the proof that the proof by induction works, but just finding the darn pattern and turning it into a formula. Sometimes that's the hardest part, is being able to look at what you've got, figure out what's the pattern here, how can I turn this into a formula, how can I turn this into a statement that you can then go on to prove. If you need to do this and you find it difficult, I recommend checking out Tips for Finding Patterns, which is one of the parts in the lesson Introduction to Sequences. There's a lot of connections between finding the general term of a sequence and finding a formula because they're both based on a sequence, right? The formula is based on some sequence of statements effectively, and a sequence is based on some sequence of numbers. So there's a lot of connection between there. This uh, tips for finding pattern inside of introduction to sequences, you'll wind up seeing a lot of things there. A lot of the ideas there you can apply to looking at formulas. So that's a really good thing to check if you're having to work on that and you find it difficult. All right, we're ready for some examples. Prove that the below, oh, by the way, if you just skipped directly to the examples, you definitely, definitely, definitely in this case want to go back to the working example first. So if you just skip to this part directly, check out the working example first because it will explain what's going on here as opposed to it being confusing and just not having any meaning. So the working example will explain everything that's going on. If you just watched the whole lesson, sorry, I didn't mean to, you know, sorry about that. Anyway, let's go on. Prove that the below is true for any positive integer n. So we've got 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus dot 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 plus n squared equals n times n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. So this is effectively our statement pn. Not effectively, this is our statement pn. So adding all the squares, 1 squared plus 2 squared, up until n squared is equal to n times the quantity n plus 1 times the quantity 2n plus 1, all divided by 6. So our first thing to do is to show the base case, show that the base case winds up being true. So the base case would be what it would be if we plugged in a 1 for n, if it was just the first statement. So what would that wind up looking like? That's going to be, proving that would be equivalent to showing that these two sides are the same, that 1 squared is equivalent to 1, plugging in 1 for our n, 1 plus 1, plugging in 1 for our n, 2 times plugging in 1 for our n, plus 1, all over 6. Does this wind up working out to be the same? So 1 squared is 1. What's on the right side? 1 times 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 times 1 plus 1 will wind up being 3 over 6. Is 1 indeed equal to 1 times 2 times 3 is 6 over 6? And yes, indeed, that would be 1 equals 1. So we just showed our base case winds up being true. The next thing we want to work out is the inductive step. So what would our inductive step be? Well, always the first thing that happens in the inductive step is we write out what is our hypothesis? What's the thing we're assuming? So the hypothesis is we're assuming that pk, which would be 1 squared plus 2 squared up until we get to some k squared, right? Any positive integer k is equal to k. We plug in k for n, k plus 1 times 2k plus 1 all over 6. So we assume that this is true. This is our assumption. We can use this later. We can plug it in. All right. So we've got our general thing here, pn, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared up until n squared is equal to n times n plus 1 or times 2n plus 1. And our inductive hypothesis is just saying, what if we looked at some k and we assumed that at k it was true? So now we want to show so it's our job to now show that pk plus 1 is true. So it's our job to show that pk plus 1 winds up being true. Showing that pk plus 1 is true is going to wind up being equivalent to showing that 1 squared plus 2 squared plus dot 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 up until we get to k plus 1 squared up. Ah, now here's the part. We don't want to put in k plus 1 squared because we want to somehow have our pk show up, right? We're going to have to apply our hypothesis in there somewhere, so we want to have it show up. So we realize up in 1 squared plus 2 squared uh, da, 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 plus k plus 1 squared, well, what would be right before that? We go back, and instead of using k plus 1 squared as the last thing, it'll be easier to see in the pattern what's really there to make it easier to substitute is plus k squared plus k plus 1 squared. I'll break this onto a different line because now we're starting to get a little cramped. So we want to show, right, we don't know for certain, it's up to us to verify that, that that would be swap in k plus 1 now for n. So k plus 1 times k plus 1 in here would be k plus 2 times k plus 1 in here, 2 times k plus 1 plus 1, all divided by 6. So at this point we go, hey, we've got 1 squared plus 2 squared plus blah, 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 up until k squared, so we can swap that in for what's here at pk, which is this thing right here. So we can now swap that in. Now we're going to move over here, so we've got a little bit more room. So k times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1 
all over 6, right? This is our inductive hypothesis, which we assumed is true, so we can use it as we want. Plus, what's the thing that we still have left over? We still have k plus 1 squared left over. We didn't substitute out for that. So plus k plus 1 squared. And it is now our job to show that that is indeed equal to what was on the other side, which is k plus 1 times k plus 2 times 2k plus 1 plus 1. I'll simplify that a little bit, so that'll be 2k plus 2 plus 1. So that'd be 2k plus 3 all over 6. Okay. So at this point, to show that they wind up being the same on either side of that, you know, maybe it is to show that each side is the same, that the sides are equivalent, we can just wind up simplifying each of the sides, working with each side on their own. So we work with the expanding this part over here. So k times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1, k times 2k gets us 2k squared, k times 1k plus 1 times 2k, so plus 3k, 1 times 1 plus 1 all over 6, plus let's multiply this part by 6 over 6 because we know that we'll want to put them together into a single fraction so we can compare the two things, k plus 1 squared, k plus 1 times k plus 1 becomes k squared plus 2k plus 1 and is that indeed equal to, let's expand the right side, so let's expand the far right first, k plus 1 times k plus 2 times 2k plus 3, k times 2k gets us 2k squared, k times 3, 3k, 2 times 2k, 4k, so 3k plus 4k is 7k, 2 times 3 is plus 6, all divided by 6. So we can keep expanding over here, k times 2k squared is 2k cubed plus 3k squared plus k, all over 6 plus 6k squared plus 12k plus 6 all over 6. And is that equal to k plus 1 times 2k squared plus 7k plus 6? Okay, how's this one going? I'm going to do this one partially in my head. So if you get lost here, just write it out and you'll see how it worked. k times 2k squared is going to come out to be 2k cubed. k times 7k, 7k squared plus 1 times 2k squared, so 7k squared plus 2k squared is 9k squared, k times 6, 6k, 1 times 7k, 7k, 7k plus 6k is 13k, and 1 times 6 plus 6, all over 6. And finally, if we combine our two fractions on the left, then 2k cubed, everything will be divided by 6 over here, 2k cubed plus nothing on our other fraction, so that just that. 3k squared plus 6k squared, we get 9k squared. k plus 12k plus 13k, no constants on our left fraction, plus the one on our right fraction, so plus 6. And is that indeed equal to 2k cubed plus 9k squared? We see that that is indeed the exact same thing. So thus, our inductive step right here, not our inductive hypothesis, but our inductive step, just checked out. So we've now shown the base case checks out, the inductive hypothesis checks out, so combine they show that this here is always true. We have just shown that combining these two things, the base case P1 being true, and if PK is true, our inductive hypothesis, if PK is true, then PK plus 1 is true, which we just showed here. We combine those two things, so now we've shown that PN is true for all things, that 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, da, 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 up until plus n squared, is equal to n times quantity n plus 1 times quantity 2n plus 1, all divided by 6. We have completed our proof by induction. Yay! Second example, show that for n equals 1, 2, 3, da, 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 forever, that n cubed plus 2n is divisible by 3. Show, show that n cubed plus 2n is divisible by 3. So really, this is our statement pn. So pn is n cubed plus 2n is divisible by 3. So first thing we always have to do, we have to start off by showing the base case. So our base case first. So the base case is showing that the P1 statement would be true. So P1 is the same thing. Verifying P1 is the same thing as verifying that 1 cubed plus 2 times 1 is divisible by 3. So 1, square, 1 cubed plus 2 times 1, so 1 plus 2, 3. Hey, that is divisible by 3. That checks out. So our base case just checked out. Great. Next up, we want to work on the inductive step. So we work on the inductive step. Always the first thing we do in our inductive step is we draw up what is our hypothesis, what is the assumption that we can work from. So our hypothesis is going to be that pk winds up being true. What is pk? pk would be if we plugged in k for our n here. So k cubed plus 2k is divisible by 
3. So this is our starting assumption that k cubed plus 2k is divisible by 3. At this point, we now want to show that pk plus 1 is true. We want to show pk plus 1. pk plus 1, showing that pk plus 1 is true, is going to be the same thing as showing that k plus 1, plugging in k plus 1 for n now, k plus 1 cubed plus 2 times k plus 1 for n now is divisible by 3. So now we just need to show if this is divisible by 3, then we will have proven our inductive step as well, so we will have shown the whole thing. So from here on, let's just take a look, close look at k plus 1 cubed plus 2 times k plus 1. So k plus 1 cubed plus 2 times k plus 1 Hopefully we'll have enough room to work this out. k plus 1 cubed, well, we can write that as k plus 1 times k plus 1 squared. What's k plus 1 squared? That's k squared plus 2k plus 1 plus 2 times k plus 1. That's 2k plus 2. k plus 1 times k squared plus 2k plus 1. Well, k times k is going to be k cubed. k times 2k, 2k squared plus 1 times k squared, so plus 3k squared. Uh, k times 1 plus 1k plus 1 times 2k, 2k, so plus 3k total plus 1 times 1, 1. Also, in the next lesson, we talk about the binomial theorem. We'll recognize and go, oh, yeah, that's definitely how it has to expand, plus 2k plus 2. Okay, so at this point, we can realize, hey, what was our hypothesis? Our hypothesis was that k cubed plus 2k is definitely divisible by 3. Hey, look, here's k cubed. Here's 2k. Let's bring them together. So now we've got k cubed plus 2k, and we'll put everything else on the other side. So 3k squared plus 3k, and we've got a 1 here and a 2 here, so that combines to plus 3. So now we can look at each part of this independently. k cubed plus 2k, that's a thing, plus, and we can over here, we've got a 3 here, a 3 here, a 3 here, so we can pull a 3 out. So 3 out of k squared plus k plus 1. Now at this point we realize, oh hey look, by our inductive hypothesis, we knew that this is divisible by 3. So we know that that's divisible by 3. Furthermore, we've got 3 times k squared plus k plus 1. Well, anything that we wind up multiplying by 3 on it, well, that's got already has a factor of 3 multiplied in, so it must be divisible by 3. So that means both parts, so both parts that we're adding together are divisible by 3. If both parts that we add together are divisible by 3, then it must be that the entire thing is divisible by 3, right? Something over here is divisible by 3, something over here is divisible by 3. Well, that means I can divide this thing by 3, I can divide this thing by 3, so even when we put them together, I can still divide the thing by 3. So since both parts are divisible by 3, that means that k plus 1 cubed plus 2 times k plus 1, which we just showed, has to be divisible by 3. So we've just shown that if pk is true, then pk plus 1 is true. So we have now shown the inductive step so since we have shown that P1 is true, and if something in the middle is true, then the next thing is true, then P1 being true implies that P2 must be true by our inductive step, which implies that P3 must be true by our inductive step, P4, P5, P6, P7. So we know that forever and always n cubed plus 2n is divisible by 3. We have completed our proof by induction. Yay! Next proof, last example. Come up with a formula that gives the value of the nth partial sum of the sequence below. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Then prove that your formula always works. The first few partial sums of the sequence are below. So our first partial sum would be just adding 1 together, so that's 1. Our next partial sum would be adding just 3 together, so that's, sorry, 3 onto what we had before, so that'd be 1 plus 3. The next thing would be 5, so 1 plus 3 plus 5. Next thing would be 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7. Next thing would be 9. Let's write that out as well. So 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9. If we were to keep going with this pattern, what would be next? Well, that'd be 11 next, right? We're adding by 2 each time, so 1 plus 3 plus 5, plus 7, plus 9, plus 11. Let's see if we can figure out what the pattern going on here is. So 1 on its own, well, that's just 1. 1 plus 3, hey, that's 4. 1 plus 3 plus 5, well, that's 9. Add on another 7, 7 plus 9, that's 16. Add on another 9, that's 25. Add on another 11, that's 36. Hey, we've got an idea on what the formula is. It looks like the nth partial sum, so it looks like the nth partial sum is going to be equal to n squared. Great. So what we've got here is 1 plus 2, sorry, not 1 plus 2, but 1 plus 3. 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus blah, 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 plus 
something, what do we end on, is equal to n squared. So we need to figure out what do we end on. How do we call out each member of this sequence? Well, we can remember what we did in arithmetic sequences. We see we've got 1 as our starting place. We add up by 2 each time. So we, we could realize that the nth term here, a n, is equal to 2n minus 1. We verify this, right? n at 1 gets us 1. n at 2 would get us 3. n at 3 would get us 5. So this works out. So we see that what we're going up to is 2n minus 1. So our statement, the pn statement, is that 1 plus 3 plus 5 working up until 2n minus 1 is equal to n squared for any n. So that's what we figured out our formula is for how we're adding up these, uh, how we're getting these partial sums. As we add up more and more terms of the sequence, we've now figured out how formula, right? We figure out how does these, how does these, uh, this pattern of adding things up, how does that come to be? We see, oh, we've got n squared coming up out of, we do this each time. On the first term, right, n equals 1, we've got 1, n equals 2, we've got 4, n equals 3. So we see that each time it's just squaring that number. We also have to figure out what does the sequence of the things look like, because we have to be able to figure out what do we end on. We have to be able to say what's the last thing, so that we can actually work with having a left side and a right side to our uh, statements equation. But at this point, we're now ready to prove this. All right, so now it's just up to us to prove that this is indeed true, that pn of, that our statement pn is true for any value of n, that 1 plus 3 plus 5 up until plus 2n minus 1 is equal to n squared, no matter what n we put in, as long as n is a positive integer. So first thing we prove, always prove the base case first, because it's almost always easier. Also helps you understand how the thing comes together. So base case, so p1, showing that p1 is true, is going to be the same thing as showing that 1 added up until, well, we just added up to 1, right? So that's just 1 on the left side. Is that equal to 1 squared? Yep, 1 is equal to 1. That was pretty easy, right? So there's our base case knocked out. Next up, we do the inductive step. Now we want to show that the inductive step is going to wind up being true. So first thing we always do, we assume our hypothesis first. What is our hypothesis going to be? Our hypothesis will be that pk is true. What is the statement pk? Well, that would be 1 plus 3 plus up until we get to plus plug in k for n, 2k minus 1 equals k squared. So we are assuming that 1 plus 3 plus blah, 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 plus 2k minus 1 is equal to k squared. OK, so with that assumption that this thing is true, we need now to show that k plus 1 is going to be true as well. So now we want to show that k plus 1 is true. So showing k plus 1 is true is going to be equivalent to showing that 1 plus 3 plus dot 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 plus 2k minus 1, sorry, not 2k minus 1, we're going to swap out k plus 1 for n here, so 2 times k plus 1 minus 1 equals k plus 1, swapping out that n as well, that n here as well for k plus 1 squared. Now remember, we want to have our hypothesis show up somewhere. We have to get our hypothesis to show up somewhere. So we realize, oh, hey, that's really this part up to here. So we can rewrite this as 1 plus 3 plus dot, 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 until we get to 1, you know, to that back a step of 2. So that would be 2k minus 1. Forward a step by 2, we see that that would be 2k uh, plus 1. If we work out this value here, we wind up seeing that's the same thing here, right? 2k plus 2 minus 1 is just 2k plus 1. And we want to show that that is equal to k plus 1 squared. Okay, so we bring this up here. And on the way, we're going to go, hey, right here, from here to here, we assumed up here that this was true. So that means what we've got previously, sorry, what we've got in the thing we're trying to show, pk plus 1, that part of it, is going to just be equal to k squared right here. So we can swap out k squared here. So now we've got k squared plus what still remains. So that's 2k plus 1. Oh, and we want to show that this is true. So it's a question mark here. We don't know for sure that it's true yet. It's up to us to show that it winds up being true. So plus what remained there, 2k plus 1. Is that equal to k plus 1 squared? So k plus 1 squared, well, let's just simplify it. We've got k squared. We expand this. Well, k squared plus quantity 2k plus 1, well, that's just 2k plus 1. Is that equal to, what do we get when we expand k plus 1 squared? Well, that's k squared plus 2k plus 1. Hey, we wind up seeing that is indeed true. 
that is always going to wind up being true, so we have shown our inductive step is true. With this hypothesis in mind, we know that the next thing down the line, with pk being true, we know that pk plus 1 must be true. So because we know our base case is true, p1 is true, and we know that if something is true, then the next thing has to be true, then since p1 is true, the next thing must be true, p2 is true, p3 is true, p4 is true, p5 is true, p6 is true, and the fireworks keep going forever and ever, we see that everything is always true, so we have that this statement winds up being true for absolutely every single n that we would plug into it. We have completed the proof. Our proof is done. Pretty cool. The only really challenging part there, right, that wasn't that difficult to proof by induction compared to the ones that we did previously. The challenging part there was being able to figure out what that formula is in the first place. So once again, if you have difficulty with that, I recommend check out the arithmetic sequences and series. There's that section, tips on finding patterns, that will really help you see how to find patterns. There's a lot of good stuff in there. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.